Hey everybody! So recently we've been using Unreal Engine to create ragdolls for VFX shots. It may not be as powerful as a dedicated simulation program like Houdini, but it's a lot faster. And if you're making a video game that needs ragdoll effects, this will be helpful for you too. So let me show you how I did it. So first things first, you need a character working in Unreal, and this is set up exactly the same way as I set up the superhero character from that previous video we made, where I showed you how to make a third person character. So you can use the default Unreal character, but if you want to set up your own character, you're going to want to pause and go follow that first video we made. Okay, so right now the character is set up with the same functionality as that video like I mentioned. And what we need to do is add a quick control, which will make the character ragdoll. So whether you have a custom character or you're using the default character, go into the third person folder, go into blueprints, and then into the character blueprint. And in the event graph, we want to add a keystroke, which is going to activate the ragdoll effect. So I'm going to use the one key. I'm just going to type one and search for this one right here with the little picture of the keyboard. And what this is saying is when the one key is pressed, we can say set simulate physics on the mesh. And I'm going to click the checkbox to say simulate. Let's compile and save and see if that worked. So now when I run around, I can press one and he falls through the floor. Now the problem is it's because it's simulating physics on the character as a whole as if it was just one solid object. In fact, it's simulating the physics based on this capsule shape right here. So what we need to do is go into the blueprint, go into the viewport and click on the capsule. And I'm going to search for collision. And where it says collision preset, I'm going to switch it to ragdoll and press compile and save. And now it's going to simulate based on the physics asset of your character. Okay, so let's test it out. I'm going to press play. He's running around. And if I press one to simulate physics, he does some strange stuff. So we have some work to do. The first thing I want to do is I want to make the camera actually follow him. So notice when I press simulate physics, I can still run around as like a ghost. <laughs> so let's fix that. And to fix that, we're just going to go into the viewport and I'm going to grab the camera boom and I'm going to drag and drop it underneath the mesh of the character. So now the camera will follow his body and not the capsule. If you remember from the previous video where we set up our characters, this capsule is the character and the dude inside is just a little piece of art. So we want the camera to follow this guy and not the third person character, which is the capsule. So now we can see that the camera is following. But as we can see, he's not really moving properly. He doesn't behave as if he's made of flesh and bone like a person. So go into the folder where you set up your character and you should find something called a physics asset. We're going to double click on this and we can see these capsules around all of his joints. Those are the actual collision objects. That's how he's colliding with the ground. So we want to take some time to size this and scale everything so it fits his body a little better. And then if you zoom in inside of each of these joints, there's this constraint and that's showing how much each joint can rotate. And the problem is the computer doesn't know that this is a knee and that it can only bend one way. And so it's bending backwards and it's kind of too flexible. So we want to adjust that. But first let's get these capsules adjusted. So I'm going to click on one of these and the way these scale is a little interesting. If I grab this vertical axis, it's going to stretch longer or squish shorter. And then any of the other two axes will just uniformly scale it this way to make it skinnier. And it doesn't have to be perfect. We just want it to be a little bit tighter, a little bit closer to his skin. And it can be kind of tedious, but it's definitely worth it. It will make the character look a lot more realistic and a lot more grounded. Some of them may be crooked too, so check the rotation of them. Now frequently I find that it only creates one capsule for the entire arm, so the upper and the lower arm. And it's hard to tell whether this capsule goes to the upper arm joint or the elbow joint. But if you click on the capsule and you look here, you can see which joints it's connected to. So it looks like it's the actual upper arm joint. And you can also see here the constraint is coming out of here and there's not one coming out of the elbow. So that means that this capsule goes to the upper arm. And if you're missing one for the lower arm, I'll show you how to add that. So we can't see the skeleton and we also don't see the joints listed here in the list. So we can turn those on by going up to character, go to bones, all hierarchy. And now we can see all of the joints in his body. And then if we want to see them over here in the list, we can also do that here by clicking on show all bones. So I can click on the right forearm bone right here. You can see it lights up. So that's the correct one. And you can right click on the bone in the list and go to add slash replace bodies. And we can see that it added a collision object and it added a constraint to the elbow. So we can edit that later. Let's do the same thing to the other arm. So here's the left forearm. I'm going to right click and go add 
slash replace bodies, and there we go. And if you notice that other joints are also missing their collision objects, you can do that on those joints as well. So for example, I just went to go add a collision object to the neck, and I can see that this collision object actually is for the neck. So pay attention to the names of the capsules and which joint they go to. So let's reposition this down on the neck joint, and that means that the head doesn't have one. So let me click on the head joint, and I'll right click and go add slash replace bodies, scale it into place, and so far it's looking pretty good. I do want to show you guys, if you don't want the capsule shape, you want a different shape, we can actually change that. I can click on this capsule for the hand, and let's say I want a cube instead, where it says primitive type right here. I can change this from capsule to box, and then click on regenerate bodies. Sometimes different shapes will fit your character better. And maybe I want to do that same thing for all the hands and the feet. Okay, I'm going to press save. And it's not done yet, we still haven't fixed the constraints for the joints, but I want to see how it behaves. I like to check it at every stage to make sure that it's getting better. So let's try it again. And we can see that he collides with the ground a little bit better, he's still too floppy. So let's go back in here. And now what we have to do is adjust the range of motion for each of these joints. Now this is going to be a little bit time consuming, a little bit tedious, so I won't do all of them on camera. But I do want to show you how I figured out the best way to set this up, and that's just by looking at the default third person character. So if you go into the content folder characters, under mannequins, and then go into rigs, you can see PA mannequin physics asset. And this is the default character. So we can look at how they set up their constraints and sort of copy it. So I'm gonna go up to character. I'm gonna to go to bodies and set it to wireframe so I can see the constraints. And if you click on the knee joint or something, you can see the range of motion that they went with. Now one thing I want you to take note of before you click out of their default mannequin is kind of go through the settings here and just make sure that all the constraints have the similar settings on your model. One thing you'll notice that all of their joints have in common is they set the S lerp, which is short for spherical lerp, under target velocity to 30. And this just means that it's going to have a little bit of resistance. So just like a human body, it's got muscles and tendons and it's going to offer some resistance to movement. So let's set that up first. Again, I'm going to go to character, bodies, set it to wireframe. And over here in my list, I'm going to turn off show bodies and turn on show constraints. I'm going to select all of my constraints. I'll scroll way down to the bottom and I'll turn on under target velocity, S lerp and set the strength to 30. So now all the joints have a little bit of resistance. And then under angular limits, I'm going to set them all to limited. And notice that I'm keeping their mannequin open so I can constantly check to make sure that I have the same range of motion on each joint. So let's start with the knees here. So I'm going to click on my character's knee. And the first thing I'm going to do is rotate it so it's the same orientation as this one. So the x-axis points outward and the y-axis points backwards like this. To lower the range of motion, like they have here on the x-axis, you can go right here where it says angular limits and you can set the swing one and swing two limit to five degrees and it looks like they have their twist limit to 60. That's up to you how much you want the knee to be able to bend. So I'm gonna set my swing limits to five degrees and then we'll start with the same range of motion they have. I may lower it for my guy. And you will also notice something strange. It looks like their axes are split. See how it looks like there's two Z axes, two blue ones. There's actually two green ones too. There's one pointing down right here. The way we get that to work is you rotate this so it's pointing downward, and then you're gonna alt rotate it like that. So let's do the same thing on the other knee. And now it's just a matter of going around to each joint and setting the range of motion that you want or by copying the ones that they use if you're not sure. Okay, and once you're done adjusting those constraints, you can test out the ragdoll. And we can see it feels a lot more like a human body, it feels a lot more like there's bones and muscles and tendons and things don't bend the wrong way. So do some thorough testing to make sure that the range of motion feels correct on every joint and you can sort of tighten it up a little bit if you want more of a stiff feel. But one thing you may notice is that his legs kind of go crazy and when people are kind of flying through the air or when they land they kind of go sort of into the field position they kind of curl up a little bit. I don't know if I want his limbs to go that wild at least not his legs. So I'm going to add another constraint and if you want to see what we're about to do, we can look back at this default character and we can see these constraints that are kind of floating behind the knee. If you want to see what those are connected to, you can look over here in the graph and I can see that this is a constraint which is connected from the pelvis down to the calf bone. So it goes from the pelvis up here and it skips this bone here 
and it connects to the calf. So I'm going to add that constraint to our character. Now if you're using the Mixamo skeleton, instead of pelvis you have hips. So I'm going to grab the hips collision shape, not the bone, but the collision shape. And then instead of calf, we have the right leg. So once again, I'm not grabbing the right leg bone, I'm grabbing the collision object, which is the capsule. Then I'll right click and go constrain selected bodies. So now we have this new constraint right here, and we can see this is going from the hips to the right leg, which is the lower leg. So let's move this into place. And if we take a look at how this one's set up, it's a little bit different. Notice we don't have the s -lerp turned on, and we can see the twist motion is free, but the swing motions are constrained at 90 degrees. So let's do that. I'm going to leave the twist motion to free, but I'm going to constrain the swing motions both to 90 degrees. You can also see that it's oriented a little differently. So I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees this way, so that the x-axis is pointing down, and then I'm going to hold down Alt and rotate it up a few degrees like this. And let's do the whole process again for the other leg. So I'll click on the hips collision object and I'll go down to the left leg collision object and I'll right click and go constrain selected bodies. We will move this. I'll set the swing motion to limited and I'll constrain it to about 90 degrees. Rotate that down and I'll rotate this the same way as we see in the default character. Okay, let's try this out. And when we do ragdoll, but you can see that something went wrong. <laughs> Unless this is what you want, it's kind of cool. So the reason it was freaking out is because I forgot to set a certain setting. So click back on your two new constraints and I'm going to turn off enable projection and then I'm going to set the linear limits to free so that they can move freely. Because what was happening was the legs were being locked in place so they couldn't move. Even if the knees could bend, the legs couldn't move from the position they were in. So now when I press one, he sort of collapses. Cool. I'm gonna do a little test where he jumps in the air. It looks like my range of motion is a little bit wonky on some of the joints, like his knee bends a little backwards. I can fix that. But I like the way his hips rotate now. I feel like they're not quite as wild. And yeah, it looks like my knee rotation got a little messed up, so let's make sure it only bends backwards. I feel like his range of motion on his hips is still a little bit big, so we can tone that down by maybe lowering the degrees that it can move, and that'll make him a little more stiff. There we go. Now the next thing is, notice that when you go to ragdoll mode, it maintains the velocity and the trajectory of all of his joints. So if I'm running, he'll just kind of fall forward. But if I'm in the air, he'll keep going in the direction he was going, including each individual joint. So I purposely chose for this project a jump animation where he flings his arms outward. And that way I can simulate little explosions or something like this. So because he swings his hand, if I press ragdoll right when I press jump, you can get some wild random flailing animations and it kind of simulates an explosion like he stepped on a landmine. So maybe I can have him blow up and go over this box. And that's the secret. Again, it's not as powerful a simulation technique as doing this in Houdini or a dedicated program like that, but if you need a really quick ragdoll, you can set this up pretty quickly and do some pretty interesting ragdoll animations. Now it's kind of useless if you can't get it out of Unreal Engine and into the program that you're working in, like Blender or Maya. So let me show you how to do that as the final step. So we need to record our gameplay and export it as an animated FBX. So to do that, um, I need him to be in the scene before I press play. Notice that he's not in the scene until I press play currently. And that's because the character is actually not in the scene. This is the player start. So I'm going to delete this player start object. I'm going to go down to my third person, blueprints, and I'll drag the actual blueprint into the scene so that he starts in the scene. And that way when we press record, he's already in the scene and the computer is able to watch what he's doing. Now to make sure that we possess this character once we press play, I'm going to search for the word possess and where it says auto possess player, I'm gonna switch this to player zero. And that just means that when I press play, now I'm controlling that character just like before. Okay, now we need something called a take recorder. If you go up to window cinematics and you don't see the take recorder right here, that just means that you need to enable the plugin. So to do that, go up to settings, plugins, and search for take recorder. Click here to activate it. You'll probably have to restart the program. Go ahead and click restart if it asks you. And now we can go up to Window, Cinematics, and bring up the Take Recorder. Notice that we also have the sequencer in our scene. 
So what the Take Recorder does is it will pay attention to whatever objects you add to it and record whatever they do. So it's not like a camera, you have to tell it what objects you're trying to record. Right now there's no objects in our Take Recorder. So I'm going to click on my character. Notice that BP third person is selected. So in the Take Recorder I can click Add Source from Actor and then whatever you have selected will be right here. So now he's inside the Take Recorder. If I was going to do something like run into one of these blue cubes and I needed to record that action as well, then you would want to click on the cube and also add it to the take recorder. But I just want to record this character. Okay, next we need to press play and record. It won't work if you press record first from my experimentation. But you have to be careful because if you press play, notice your mouse is free. If you click in the scene, you're no longer able to click on the record button because you're playing the game now. So when I press escape, make sure you press play don't click in this main window and then press record. So let's press play, come over here and press record. It's going to give you a quick countdown. And now we can do whatever we needed to do. Let's see if we get a good ragdoll animation. That's kind of cool. When you're done, press escape and it saves a take. Notice now we're on scene one, take two. If you want to record another take, just do it again. And you can do this as many times as you want. And we'll press escape. So how do we get this now out of Unreal into whatever program that we're using? So we can go ahead and close the take recorder now. And if we look in our content browser, you should see a new folder called cinematics inside the content folder. Inside of that, you'll see takes. Inside of that, you'll see today's date. And you may be tempted to click on this. See how it says scene one, take one, scene one, take two. This is not what you want. If we had recorded multiple objects, this is like the entire scene, all the objects. We don't want that. We want to export each object individually. So you want to go into the sub scene. I liked the first take, so I'm going to go into scene one, take one, sub scenes right here. And this is the one you actually want to click on. This is the character itself. Once again, we only recorded one thing, but if we had recorded multiple objects, they would all be listed here and you have to export them one at a time. So here's the main character, I'm going to click on him. And if I scrub through this timeline, you'll see the animation that we recorded. Pretty cool. To export this, don't click on anything in the list because we want to export everything. So if you click on nothing, it'll just assume you want to export all this stuff. So click here on the little wrench, go up to export. So I'll just navigate where I want it to go and I'll call this secret agent ragdoll and I'll press save. When these options come up, don't just press export. There's a couple things you want to turn on where it says export preview mesh, turn that on. And where it says snap skeletal motion to root, turn that on. And that's because the character flailing and running and doing all those poses is one animation and where the capsule is in space is a different animation. So by turning this on, you sort of combined it into one animation that's gonna be baked onto the character's bones. So now I'll press export and it's done. Next, open up your favorite modeling program. I'm more comfortable with Maya, but this should work just fine in Blender or Cinema 4D. And now we just want to drag and drop our FBX into our scene. And here's the character inside of Maya. So from this point, I could model some scene geometry or some other props for him to land on. He actually didn't land on the floor, he landed on top of a cube. So maybe I could put a car model there or something like that. So there's one downside to this technique that I haven't figured out how to fix yet. So if you know how to fix this, maybe leave a comment and let me know because I really want to know. But the animation is actually starting way over on frame like 190,000, <laughs> like way down the timeline. So what I've been doing is selecting all of the keyframes on the timeline and just dragging them down to frame zero. I haven't found any export options that will fix that. So if you know the answer to this conundrum, definitely leave a comment for us because we want to know how to fix it. But even with that downside, it's still such a quick and easy way to create ragdolls for VFX that I use this technique all the time and I plan to use it in the future. So if you make anything cool with this technique, be sure to share it on our Discord or tag us on Instagram with it. Alright, later creators.